Hello, welcome to the EF Core Community Stand-Up. Hopefully we are live here. We've had a few technical issues in the last few minutes, so if we're, we're not, not live yet, guys. <laughs> okay, we're not live because it says live on my thing. Hello, welcome to the... Yes, we are. Yeah, yeah. It's just oh, yeah. delayed. I, guess I can hear are. it on Shai's uh, thing. Okay, so we messed Sorry. up there. Well, let's <laughs> just forget that didn't happen and we'll start again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the EF Core Community Stand-Up. Um, we have a kind of Perf-focused uh, session today. Um, John P. Smith is with us, author of uh, Entity Framework Core in Action, and he's going to show us performance tuning um, of uh, an application using EF Core, which is uh, great. And then we have Jeremy, uh, myself, and Shai from the EF team here as kind of per normal. Um, so, uh, since we've got quite a lot to cover today, we might run over. Let's uh, let's get started and uh, do the state of the unicorn. I can hide that. Um, so, what are we? What's going on right now? Um, hopefully, everybody's aware on this uh, call that EF Core Six Preview One is live on NuGet now. Um, it has. Um, about 5,000 downloads as of this morning. Um, it's uh, We haven't had any bad feedback. There's no real reason to do it. Best version of VF Core there's ever been because it's got all the latest code in. So get the daily build now and we'll get preview one and start using it. Also, 5.03 is out there with, with patches. Um, so if you're using 5.0, make sure you upgrade to 5.03 to get the latest bug fixes there. Um, so that's VF Core uh, 6 preview one. What is the team currently working on? So Andre is currently working on uh, metadata refactoring for compiled model. Um, so if you look at our metadata infrastructure, it's basically set up to allow different access to different kinds of model at different times. So when you're running the application, you get basically a, a read-only version of the model, not mutable. But when you're building the model, it's mutable. That's all been done with interfaces and extension methods, and it's being refactored so that, but currently you get the same model at runtime as uh, as you do when you're building. With the compiled model, the actual implementation will be different under the surface. And so Andrew's doing a bunch of refactoring to, to make that happen. Um, you see, if you're interested, you can look at a, a bunch of PRs from Andrew. Uh, Maurice is currently working on temporal tables phototyping. So he's, you know, we had the design uh, discussion kind of on the issue uh, there. So go read that if you want to figure out what we're planning to do. Maurice is now making sure that we can execute those queries and they do what we expect and it all works. So that's pretty exciting. Um, Perf, we're working on Perf. In fact, Shai is working on Perf. And in fact, there's this great uh, issue where this is linked from you know the the EF Core six plan and everything, but this is basically the issue that Shai has for improved performance on Tech Empower, and down here you can see we have the pull requests and the improvements they made. Do you want to quickly go through this, Shai? Sure, I'll, just a few words. So Perf is obviously very complex. Um, this specifically is about improving EF Core runtime performance. So this is not about, uh, this specific thing is not about generating better SQL, for example, which could also improve EF Core performance, which is also very important. That's covered elsewhere. This is really about reducing the overhead of what happens when EF Core sends queries for you. It's also very specifically about uh, uh, the, the what is called the tech power fortunes benchmark. So this is kind of like an industry standard scenario scenario, which is used to measure, uh, you know, basic uh, web performance with a database backing it and so on. Uh, it's something that a lot of people look look at. And I th it's important for us that uh, this perform this specific kind of scenario, which is also a common user scenario, in that scenario, we don't want EF Core to add a lot of overhead. So our, like, let's say our goal, which we, we're not sure we're going to be able to reach, is to have the same kind of performance as Dapper, which, uh, which is a micro ORM where you specify raw link SQL. It's a very, very thin kind of thing compared to EF Core, which is a very different kind of beast. So it's a very ambitious kind of target. But if you're interested in, you know, in the kind of improvements, take a look at this issue and you can look at the specific PRs. Um, this is basically about making EF Core just run faster for everybody doing queries with 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 EF Core, especially non-tracking queries. But yeah, that's yep. it. Yep. Excellent. And you can see here that this this uh, we started 
um, with 69, 600 uh, requests per second. DAFA was at 93. Even with this, uh, the, the low-hanging fruit, I guess you would call it, that we've done so far, we're up to 80,000. Um, so we're already creeping up on that DAFA performance. Um, so it's good to see that. Whether we'll get there, you know, Shai and I were talking about that this morning, but we've got lots of ideas still to go. So it's looking good. Um, okay. Let's go back to here. So that's Perf, Doc of the Week. Um, so we have a Doc of the Week. This time, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but this is uh, performance guidance for EF Core. So we had an EF6 white paper. Um, this is essentially the same kind of guidance for EF Core uh, on how to do performance. Um, here it is. You know, Shai, do you want to just say a few words since this is your doc, basically? Sure. Uh, so it's it's basically, you can see this is a top level section in the EF docs. If you look to the left, it's very easy to find. Um, I'm not going to go, uh, there's a whole lot of content here. It's basically split into different uh, sections. I think the most important thing is to first read the, the introduction and the diagnosis. So diagnosis is about how do you know if you have like a problem, right? What do you do in order to even pinpoint? So I know something is running slow, but how do I know which which query is problematic, for example? So that's going to give a lot of tips into how via logging, via you know tracing, via uh, uh, SSMS, if you're using SQL Server, via which kind of tools. Once you know you have some sort of problem, then you can go into the efficient querying kind of that's that's by the way an execution plan so this is a good way of knowing whether a specific query is maybe problematic and maybe you're missing indexes for example that's like exactly how you're going to find out um, then you have like uh, uh, once you've pinpointed a problematic query then there's a whole lot of tips if, if we could go into efficient querying like super quickly again i'm not going to go through it but you can see this some of this is quite basic for people who who have done you know database performance and who know how database data, databases operate but it's surprising how much you know in issues we see people who kind of don't apply a lot of the basic things because it's very easy to miss it it's not because they don't know it's you have to think about it so there's a whole lot of like very important kind of you could look at it as tips and tricks or pitfalls to avoid and all that kind of stuff basically look through it it's supposed to be very accessible this is not a hardcore kind of under the hood thing it's really stuff that you as a user can apply very very directly in order to make your application like work more efficiently there's another way thinner section in the updating like efficient updating because there's generally a bit less to know but still there's there's some some interesting things um uh, there's again one more for modeling and another one for advanced uh, performance topics. I'm not going to go into it because it's just take a look at it. Everybody, I, I, anybody who's interested in Perf, I, I really recommend it. There's also a whole lot people who are kind of interested in how Eve Core works internally. Perf is always the best way in a way. So per, in order to do Perf well, you have to also understand exactly how things are working. That's the only way you're going to understand why things are slow or not slow, right? So this also gives quite a bit of insight into how Eve Core actually does stuff with your queries, for example, how it, what are the different phases of queries that you compile it and then you cache what, you know, the outputs of that compilation and then you execute it. So perf is all around that kind of stuff for people interested in the under the hood. I think the perf doc documents or documentation is, is a pretty good place to get that. I think that's, that's enough. Absolutely. Thanks, Shai. So uh, that's the state of the unicorn. Let's, um, let's go and look at our community links now. Um, so I have them up here, and uh, the first one is what we just looked at. So if you want to, if you didn't catch the link to that, you can go find it from our community links. Um, the second one, this is uh, a post by uh, Khaled at, uh, I believe, at, J at JetBrains. Um, and um, this is a, so let, let me, yes, I agree to that. Um, this is a really good just overview of things to look out for when you're using EF Core, potential pitfalls, things where things have, have changed, things that you might not think about. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of great information here um, that you know coming coming from outside the team has a slightly different perspective than what we would write, but um, but is, there's some really good stuff here. So definitely go check that out. Um, the next one we have on our list is uh, hot chocolate and strawberry shake for GraphQL. I'm going to let Jeremy talk to that. Sure. So this is a uh, episode that you would listen to a podcast, but we've been doing a lot of investigation of GraphQL and especially how it fits into the .NET ecosystem. You may have seen some of my ad hoc Twitter polls 
And uh, hot chocolate is one of the, the solutions for uh, .NET. It provides a server and a, a client. And this is a in-depth talk about uh, how they relate to .NET and GraphQL, the problems they're looking to solve. And uh, some things like how they are trying to maintain parity with the the schemas for GraphQL, et cetera. So definitely a good listen and, and we'll be posting and sharing more GraphQL content moving forward. Absolutely, good stuff. Um, so this is a, a code article magazine by Julie Lerman. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of good stuff in here. Basically, um, it's mostly about viewing, looking at debugging, metadata, and change tracking, um, and queries, I suppose. So there's she's looking at query strings here, how you can see what the query is generated. Um, we've gone over that before in the community standup. Um, logging details, so the things that we log and how we do that. Um, responding to events, so we've got various events here. So there's some good information on that. Um, metrics with event counters. So some good information on using event counters there, uh, interception, and uh, then also debug views, one of my favorite features, mainly because I use it myself so much when I'm debugging issues. Um, so if you don't know about debug views somehow, go read this because they're, they're super useful. So good stuff from Julie there. Um, oops, that's uh, the wrong yeah, place. So I just wanted to jump in and, and add, uh, we haven't posted this out there yet, but she will be joining us on our next community standup. Oh, so we are awesome. hosting an Ask Me Anything. And uh, <sighs> so it should be great. And uh, we'll we'll share more details about that after the show. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, Finally on the list, uh, we have the reform program, which is John P. Smith and his performance choosing for EFCore, which he's going to go over with us today. So if you want to find the link to it, it's right there on our community links. And then as always, we have the link to former uh, EFCore community standups here. So go, go back and look for the ones you've missed. Um, and I think with that, we can pass over to John and let's start on the real content here. Okay, um, so yeah, I've uh, put this up at the beginning. This uh, link here will take you to uh, an, uh, an article that I've written that goes with this um, uh, video because there's a lot to cover, right? So <laughs> I, I want to make sure uh, I get things out. So I've just finished uh, writing the second edition of Entity Framework Core in Action for Manning. And I have three chapters about um, performance tuning, about 90 pages. And I go through a, a series of work to uh, take up, uh, take a, a application and make it better and better and better. Or, well, actually giving it more to do and, mm. <laughs> and, and seeing how it, uh, goes. So that's what I'm going to go through. Um, and um, I, I, all the I'm a kind of open source guy. So you don't have to buy my book. I've got links, all, all the data is there. If you want to my, buy my book, that's fine. You don't have to. But if you <laughs> want to, you can get 40% off to by going to my site and getting a coupon. So um, for that, we'll start off I have in, in the this uh, um, in this chapter fifteen. I build a book app, oh, um, which, and I've got data from Manning. So it's got seven hundred pages, uh, seven hundred books in it. So it's, it, this is kind of trying to be a e-commerce selling books, and you can do things like. Uh, sort by publication date and uh, tags C sharp, right? So there you are. You, you, you can get, uh, and this must, this is old data. I would imagine John Skeet would have been doing a fifth <laughs> version. Um, and you can do things like add a review, et cetera. Um, and let's just um, turn that off. Um, uh, sort my votes. Um, this is my book. 
And if I click on it, you get the more details, right? Um, which was on the Manning book. And, if it, and you can see it, it's very similar. It's different layout, but it's got the same information there. Mm -hmm. So we're working with real data. Um, and so what we want to see is how it performs. Um, I've, what I do is I look first at the HTTP result, the how long it, ta it takes to come to the screen, because that's what the users see. And mm -hmm. I've instrumented this. If I, um, if I do uh, repeat it, I'm pressing F5 to just keep doing it. I have a thing here which should catch the timings. And you, you can see here it's about taking about 52 uh, milliseconds to put that up. Um, and that's, that's great. That's really quite fast. I, obviously, I'm running it locally. Um, but how did I get a book query that was fast? That's the question. So um, first year, I'll show you. you um, um, oh, yeah. So I'm going to, this is not the way to do it. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you could, I, I insist this is not the way to do it, but I want to show you could do this to, this would get all the data that needed, but uh, what you're doing is you're loading all the author links and all, the authors and all the reviews and all the tags and everything, but it's going to be very so because you're loading too much data and you'd have to sort and filter in software. You'd have to load all 700 books and then do it in software. You do not want to do that. You might get away with it 700, but so how would you do it? So I've got five rules for um, making a good read-only query. Um, first bit is um, I use a select. Uh, so let's go and have a look at the code. D -d -d. So I have um, um, this is these are called query objects. So they take in an I queryable and they push out an I queryable. And you can see here I'm I'm taking all all the specific properties that I need, right? And so I leave everything else behind. Uh, forget all these comments at the side. That's for the book man, uh, for Manning. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second one was don't use includes. But so pick what you so need. on the on the on the select one. So yep. um, we often refer to that as a projection, right? So select is how yep. in link you do a projection, meaning you're yep. projecting out only certain fields from the database, not the entire uh, row. Yep. Yep. Very important. And it's it's important to recognize that that EF core understands how to translate this and doesn't just bring back the entire row and then give you the bits you want. It only requests from yeah. the database these things, which is why this can uh, be so good for Perf. Yeah. I use it all the time. Um, so um, the other thing is uh, I want to get a string of the authors, uh, comma del delimited. So rather than re read all the, the stuff in, I just read the name of the author in the right order, right? And I string join, uh, use string dot join here. And for tags, I just get the tag ID. That's that's a string, which, you know, which has she sh C sharp or whatever in it in there. So that's the, that's the second one. So. Uh, it's interesting, sorry, I interrupt again, but I think it's interesting to look, and Shai can correct me if I'm wrong here. If you go back to that that code that you, you were just showing, um, the string join there is, I believe, the one of the places where we will, yeah. EF Core uh, 503 plus, will do client evaluation. 
Um, and that's fine because it doesn't require any more data to be brought back from the database. It's not inefficient to do it there. Um, so we, and, and yet it's very convenient to be able to do things like do string join and create a, one string from the results. Um, so that's a, just a little tidbit about how EF Core translates that. Yeah. So the, the other one, which is more interesting is if possible, move calculations into the database. Right, this gets a little bit more complicated, but it's well worth it if you can do it in and it makes a big difference in this application. So if I say reviews count, EF Core will say I can do that in SQL, right? So it will produce the SQL to do that. When it comes to getting the average of the num stars in the reviews, it can do it as well, but you have to remember that this is working on a database. If you run average in softwares using C sharp, if your collection is has got nothing in it, you'll get an exception. If you do it on a database, you'll get a null, right? And to make this work, you have to cast it to um, a nullable value. Otherwise, this will not work unless you've changed it, but I don't think you have. No, um, this is a... This is a tricky area. Um, yep. The you know obviously nullability differences between the database and uh, the language C sharp um, is tricky at the best of times. But when you're talking about these aggregate functions and what link expects them return and what the C sharp compiler expects them to turn versus what the database can return because as as John said it's a, it's different. Um, it's not clear at all what the best syntax or the best way to handle that in link is. And I think we've come to a reasonable uh, a reasonable place where most of the time we deal with the nulls correctly, but you're required to cast it to, for example, a, a nullable type if that's what you expect to get back. Yeah, but it makes a big difference. So it's worth, you know, just if, if you know that the database can do average or max or min or whatever, you've got to think, uh, there must be a way to do it, <laughs> right? And it took a while to do this. And I think and it, it's a double on SQL Server. I think on, uh, I tried it on something else and it wasn't a double. It was, a, yeah. you know, so it's the, a tricky area, but it's going to make a big, big difference Absolutely. to what you're doing. So it's worth pushing through on that. Um, uh, I'll also add uh, uh, about the general point of pushing uh, calculations to the database. Uh, the the like a very strong, very powerful point here. It's not just about the fact that it's a calculation, but the count and the average. If it's calculated in a database, that saves you from having to bring all those reviews and all the yeah. you know all that information from the database. So if it were just a matter of you know adding two things, it doesn't really matter if you do it at the client at this at the server. Basically, it's it's not a big deal. But the fact that um, uh, an aggregate basically we're talking about aggregate calculations here. Aggregate calculations allow you to express the operation in the database over a whole lot of rows, and then you get back just the result. This is a huge win, and it's always worth thinking about this. And also, I, I really like this. And and also the I, you know, when you're looking at uh, um, books, sorting on votes is going to be a pretty important thing, isn't it? With yeah. it, that's what we do. So <laughs> that is absolutely important right now you won't have might not have that count i've had used loads of times on uh client stuff uh so you know look at that next next thing um add sql indexes to any property you sort or filter on now i even i i i got a um soft delete um which is a Boolean. And I thought, oh, that'll be fine. Ah, <laughs> uh, that was wrong. That was wrong. It, 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 once I had a lot of um, um, a, a big am amount of books, it really hit it. So you really want to put them on. I, uh, shall I show you how I do that? Yeah. That Such so, a classic. <laughs> Yeah, the Boolean one is surprising to me, though, as well. Like you wouldn't expect that to make so much difference, but yeah. I mean, you have to go through all the rows, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. The day, when I, when you true. think about it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
I tell you, half, at half a million books, uh, if you have that on, a count takes 250 milliseconds. If you don't, it takes over a second. Wow. Yeah. Big change. <laughs> That's so a big change. Yeah. That yeah. is really important. Uh, and I've changed my automatic stuff to add that. Right. So next thing. Um, as no tracking, that's already been. Oh, sorry. Um, that's already been talked about. Um, it. Um, I think it's important. Um, I will show you my code. De -de -de. Um, so I put it in there, right? So um, my tests say sometimes it doesn't make any difference but um if you're loading relationships it can make a big difference uh, both in terms of making it quicker to load and also not filling up your db context with um, tracking stuff now in this case i don't actually need it because i i map to a class uh, um, called book list DTO, D data transfer object. Um, view model is another term. Um, I don't really need it, but I still put it in because maybe I'll come back and I'll change something and I'll, I will put something in. So I, I always put it in it, it, so that I know it's going to be right. So, so with uh, I was going to talk a little bit about when to use Asno tracking and and when not to use it. Um, yeah. So um, I think I think there's a um, an important thing that you say at the beginning of this, which is that you're basically doing a read only query, only query. And essentially, what what that means in terms of like a web application is basically you're reading stuff from the database and then you're sending it to the client, and you're not doing updates to it immediately, right? So in that situation, this is what we call a disconnected scenario, because basically you are reading stuff and then sending it off to another tier, and in this case, the web client, where it's disconnected from, from EF Core. In that case, it's almost always the correct thing to do is to use as no tracking, because there's no point, uh, you know, even though, as John says, if it's just a pure projection, we wouldn't track it anyway. But from a conceptual standpoint, there's no point in tracking that, right? Now, if you are doing database updates where you have a, a single unit of work to do the update, then you definitely want to use tracking for the query to do the update. And that may actually apply in a disconnected scenario when you're bringing data back to do an update, depending on how you do it. There's a lot of patterns that work there. But the important thing to realize, it, the important thing to, to understand is that if you are doing a no tracking query to, to say for perceived perf improvement, and then you take those entities that are returned from that no tracking query and, atta and attach them or update them on the same context instance. So you're essentially doing no tracking query and then saying track things, then that's wrong. And, and we see a lot of people doing that. Um, and I, I'm not entirely sure why in, in a lot of cases, um, but it may be uh, one of the reasons is that they perceive no tracking to be faster, which is true in a very general sense, but not if you're then going to turn around and track them because the overhead of querying and then tracking is higher than the overhead of querying and tracking together. And it also loses fidelity as well. So use no tracking when you're doing a read-only query and you're sending stuff to the clients. Don't use no tracking if you're then going to use that context to do updates to the database. Hopefully that made some sense. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So we've looked at that. Um, what I want to do now is uh, take things up a bit. This is 700, and, I, and I sh I've shown you a good thing, but I'm going to go up to uh, 100,000 books and uh, half a million um, reviews, right? And that will start to make things a little bit more com com hard to work for, right? So here it's coming up. Um, so yeah, so 100,000 books, um, over a half a million reviews, etc. So I ha now have, this is the original uh, 
query that you saw. And I've got some others, which I'll explain. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sort by votes. Oh, uh, just to say, these are these other books. I've got a, a little thing up here called Generate Books, which will take the original 700 and just create new ones yeah, to work with. Um, by the way, guys, it, uh, this is really quick. Uh, I, it, it can put 50,000 books and a quarter of a million reviews in one minute into the database. I think that's pretty good. That's that's uh, good. There's yeah. there's more perf to be found there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's worth it's worth saying. I mean, there's there's quite a there's already quite a bit of optimization. One of the differences between EF Core and EF Six, by the way, the old EF Six is that updates are actually batched. So when you're inserting a lot of stuff, it's not as fast as using um, you know some low level. Let's say it's pretty fast already because everything is batched in not necessarily in one go, but in big big like batches. When we're sending all those books, we don't send like one book and then one book and then one book. We send like a huge quantity of books and then another huge quantity of books and that's where a lot of the perf comes from there's still techniques that are faster than what if core does like sql server has a dedicated like a very special sql bulk copy kind of thing so does postgres and those are still going to be faster for like insane amounts of books but if core still does a pretty good job so one of the nice things if core actually does compared yeah. to if6 yeah okay um, so we we have a quick question here i want to look at from the community about no tracking i know we've moved on but just quickly um, is it the statement is redundant and increased parsing time if I add no tracking when it's not needed? So my opinion on this is because I, I was as we were talking about as no tracking, I was actually thinking in my head, well, the query pipeline actually does some things more efficiently when it knows from the beginning that it's a no tracking query. And so it may actually be higher performing to do as no tracking, even if you're doing a projection. I don't know that that's true, and I suspect it's negligible for most people. But my point is, so is adding as no tracking. That will be negligible for most people. Link, you know, the link parser has a lot more to do than that, <laughs> basically. So measure. If, if you think it's important, measure, but don't just assume, oh, we shouldn't add it because the parsing is going to be lower because you don't know what's actually going on under the hood and it could be faster without adding it. Okay. I'm going to go through. Oops, sorry. Did that That's wrong. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to quickly go through each one of these and explain them and see their performance on votes because sort by votes is the hardest thing to do on this. So I'm going to do the original um, query that we talked about, and I'm going to run it multiple times. I'm pressing S5. And if I go to his, it's taking, Ooh. yeah, a long time, right? Because there's half a million um, reviews it has to work through, yeah? So that's that's interesting. And uh, for my e-commerce, that's bad. You know, that's not a good thing. So my first step is to do a little change to it. Um, use, uh, I use user defined functions. Uh, I think Paul uh, Middleton. Middleton, added this. yes. Um, and um, so this is a way that you you can keep your link but if you know some something that you can do you can improve then um you can change a little bit of the sql um to um by adding a udf i and what i found i said oh is there a way in sql where i could make a um comma delimited list like that and i went to um i went to um sdn the docs no i went to um stack overflow and stack I found, overflow. yeah i found something that will do uh, that so i created a function a u a udf um and i have a migration where I added 
this code manually. Don't be afraid to add your own code in here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this will go. This will go into the date into the database. I then tell EF Core about it, and the brilliant thing is, if I go down here, uh, I can show you the. So, the author orders and tags string don't don't have all the the link it had before. It just has this definition of that UDF. And EF um, Core will then turn that into SQL. So let's have a look what it did. I'll sort by votes. Um, but uh, oh, oh, yeah, that's right. So here we are. St it still takes a long time, but it's <laughs> it's going to be a bit better. But you can see there, that's that's the the, the author UDF, and that's the tag UDF, and that makes it. It's not going to do anything about the um working out the uh, average but it's going to make it a simpler um uh, sequel to run and if i again get some timings i love the little helpers to show the logs by the way that's really cool yeah yeah i i was doing so much of this that i i built it all in so you can see here that it was about eight, 800 before, and now it's down to 700. So not, not great, but it was a very simple thing to do. And look yeah. at Lou, UDFs. Um, if you want to just tweak something, uh, it doesn't take much effort and it can give you a, a, a good game. So I think, I think this is, this is great. In, in the sense that it shows um, how you don't have to completely discard all of your link yep. stuff just because you want some of it to be written as raw SQL, right? So what we, what what John has done here is like taken snippets of the SQL, implemented those, and mapped them to UDFs, right, to a user defined function, um, so that basically, then it can be in your link query. So the rest of the link query is still there, it's just using a function. And in link, it just looks like you're calling a C sharp function to do something. And obviously, because of the way it's mapped, EF core knows to map that to the, the function in SQL server. So that's a very good way of incrementally uh, changing bits of your query to for perf without having to say oh i need to dump link and go, do you know from sql and do the entire uh, raw sql which you may do in other situations but it's not always necessary yeah i i think it's a great thing it it doesn't you know it only goes so far but sometimes that's all you need mm -hmm. uh, yep. so so uh, we've already talked about dapper and um i've got Dapper, and I'll show you how I do it in a minute. But if we do, I I studied in detail the link, uh, the the SQL that uh, EF Core creates, and I found one thing that it didn't do, it didn't take um, uh, take into account. There is a um, if I run this, I get this. Um, this is getting very sequely, but this is what you got to do. Um, um, what in a SQL query, you can use a, a value from the select in the order by, um, but you can't use it in a filter uh, aware, right? So EF core doesn't take in to account to that. Uh, Smith knows about that. There's a index up but um, it gives me a chance to improve this because i only have to do that once whereas ef core has to do it twice so if you look at the, the timings right so now we're four seven five, so we're it Very was eight. Nice. You know that's that's a good that's near not quite half um, the time. It was eight fifty, say, um, 
so yeah, that's a that's a really good um, thing to get. What I want to go and say though, before you get too uh, happy about that, is that I looked at other uh, queries uh, that where it didn't in include votes and uh, Dapper was not really very quicker, you know. So don't think, oh, it, it's slow. It, um, the F course clo uh, is, is slow. I'm going to take that and put it in Dapper. If it's the same SQL, you're going to gain a few milliseconds. And when you're put perfing, you want 50% at least double. <laughs> you, know, you, you really want to pull it back, right? Um, I, so... I I'm going to jump in just one thing. Uh, a, a lot of thing, like stepping back, a lot of people, a lot of things that some people miss when, you know, we're, we're talking about perf and, you know, Dapper being quicker, faster than EF and so on. In the normal case, when you're programming, the overhead of anything like Dapper or EF core is going to, in most cases, going to be negligible compared to everything else that's going on. So if you're actually talking to a database and sending a real query that causes your database to go, uh, you know, read stuff from the disk, like in a real world scenario, the overhead that EF core adds compared to any like any of these frameworks is likely going to be negligible. Now I'm not going to say it's always negligible, and that's also why we're we're spending the, the effort, the time and effort in this release to reducing that overhead. But don't assume that you know uh, in in a real world application and something that's not like a tailored benchmark that these things actually are going to matter to your final like business results, so to speak. That's a very important kind of fallacy that a lot of people sometimes yeah. think. About. About. Absolutely. Can I add something to that too? Um, so I'd also like to add that it comes back to the old adage that we've mentioned already, which is basically test, test your perf, uh, you know, because yeah, you might not get an improvement in Dapper and you over EF core that's useful to you. So, so make sure you test. Uh, I also think that you see there's things like the tech and power benchmarks that we we mentioned earlier, which are basically those are usually doing relatively simple tasks. And so, you know, the fortunes benchmark that we we often look at again is uh, correct me if I'm wrong, shy, but it's reading a single entity from the database and returning it to the client. Is that correct? It's not one row. It's I think about eight rows. Eight rows, uh, but a small but number. It's not just that. I mean, it's a small number. It's also so the network is basically negligible because the database yeah. is, is like connected via super low latency link. Yeah. Everything is cached at the database, so the database is never doing any I, any actual I/O. So this is not what we call a real world scenario. Yeah, it's it's a well, benchmark. Let's 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 be clear though. It, it is a real world scenario for certain for certain people. Like sure. the, having a very high throughput uh, application that serves simple queries very quickly can be an important scenario for people. Uh, it's, I'll not often, it, it, it's not often, it's not often a, a typical th real world It's scenario. not typical uh, for most yeah. most applications that we see customers working with. Very um, true. But uh, the reason for bringing that up is those simple scenarios are where you do see the overhead of VF Core or Dapper playing a big part because as Shai said before, you're not doing all of that complex stuff on the database that's gonna be slow. So then the overhead, uh, Percentage-wise, that your your framework uses is uh, is more, and so in a sense, when you look at benchmarks like the the Tech in Power Fortunes benchmark, that's kind of the worst case for something like EF Core. Um, and in a lot of cases, as John is showing, really in a real-world scenario, that overhead that you see between difference between Dapper and EF Core is not relevant to show we're seeing. So it's important to really understand your scenario and what you're doing, I think, is the, is the yeah. take home from that. I'd also, um, I'll just show you the Dapper code because it's not trivial to write. It's, it's very easy to, to, um, to run a Dapper in um, EF core. It, uh, there it is. You get the context, get a DB context and away you go. But look at all this. I have to manually build all the SQL in the right order and put it all together and everything. It's a, it's a bit of a pain, right? <laughs> so uh, just be, be aware of that. Okay, we are, um, I've got one more, no, I'll drop that. So I'm gonna go to 
another level. Um, let's go. I'm going to just sh shut down. So are we yet uh, there yet? No, we're not. We're going to go to half a million books. Um, so let's start this up. So um, I wanted to push it again. And um, I it's starting up. So um, Oh, yeah, I left that out. So what I'm doing now, and this is in chapter 16, this is I wanted to go another step up. So I used command at a query responsibility segregation, CQRS is easier to say, um, which is a, a, a way where it, it talks about the reads are different, different to a write. So, um, and what happens is um, what I have done is just for the uh, display of books, uh, when anything that happens to the book, the reviews, the uh, you know, whatever, it, it does this projection, um, which is like, um, uh, oh, I didn't, didn't show the cash one. We're, we're running a bit behind time. Um, that's a pity. No. We can go back to it. I mean, like I said, we can run over a little bit if we need to. Okay. Um, yeah, all right, I will. I okay. Will. Sorry. I was just looking at the time. Um, so I will just go back to this, uh, go back to where I was um, and start it again. So there was one... Um, thing I didn't show you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and it's uh, SQL cached. So what I do here is I um, pre-calculate um, some values um, and particularly things like the average um, um, votes and the counts and all that sort of stuff. And and I, I call it SQL cache. Uh, some people call it denormalization, but I, I want to call it cache because everybody knows caches are difficult. <laughs> well, no, they're easy, but they can go <laughs> wrong. <laughs> yes. So that's why I it's call it It's one of the, the two hardest things in computers, right? Cache, yeah. and, yes. uh, cache and validation and naming. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what I've done here, I'll show you the code. Uh, D -D -D, um, up here, books, going to the book. Um, what I've done, I'm not using Redis or anything like that. What I've done is I've put these into the database, into the, I've added extra properties into my book entity right um so it's in the database i quite like that because um if you're running multiple um instances of your asp.net core application it's all in the database it's going to work for everybody right um mm -hmm. so i um that's what i do i fill all those in um and go back to the code uh, you can see particularly this this one's going to help us isn't it because i pre-calculate it right so if i now i'm on sql cache short by votes one two three four five six bang now that's what i call fast wow yeah that is fast. And I've used this with clients and it's a great way of working. You have to be very careful. Um, and I'm not going to explain all about this now. We haven't got the time. But in the article, there's a link to uh, um, another article that explains all about this. Right. It's a great way of working. Um, I will just do it. 
Um, so you uh, you start you started off with how many um, when it was uh, about fifty when we started that was with seven hundred books. Yeah. And now we're at half a million. Yeah. And it's uh, still the same speed because of the changes you made. Yeah. That's exactly. awesome. That's yeah. how it should look like. <laughs> yeah. It's and that's great. So I use a, a, um, something that uh, Jimmy Bogart um, came up with called uh, um, domain events. So when I uh, when I add a review or remove a re review or anything like that, I it, it, it goes in the normal way. But I send a, 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 an event and an event handler says, oh, it's it's changed. I better update these cash values. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I get it to do. I um, the, the thing to watch out for is is multiple concurrent updates right that's that's the thing and there's a couple of yeah. ways you could handle it you could do it with a a, a locking in the, the transaction but that has problems on uh indexes um so i did it by concurrent concurrency catching uh and that's explained in that article it's a great way to do it but it's it is a bit hard work right so Sounds now, good. Yeah, uh, the normalization is, uh, I think, really one of the most powerful techniques for speeding up a database. Uh, a lot of people, like you know, people think a database should be normalized, like in database design, and that's very true. So some people kind of stay away from this kind of thing. But there's n denormalization isn't actually contradictory to normalization uh, for people coming like from the more theoretical side, and it's extremely important for Perf. Uh, I'll just point out uh, in the performance docs, which we discussed in the very beginning, basically most of the page on updates is about this uh, so it, it shows there are various tools so John here showed like a more man like a more manual approach to doing invalidation basically cache cache invalidation that hard problem which is where your application detects when you know something is is going to be changed and invalidates or, or recalculates the value that is cached there are some things that relational databases uh, provide you that can be used to make life a bit easier uh, there's computed columns which can work if what you're caching is in the same row you have materialized views for completely different views of, of you know of something that's cached that you can kind of recalculate like twice a day if that's enough for you or once an hour or whatever so Really, I mean, I love what what the, what John is is showing there, and it's also quite important to show that it's possible to do it reliably via the application. Take a look at all these mechanisms, and in in general, it's a great way to enhance performance. Yeah, so we're gonna. I'll go back to this. Um, ding ding. So the, I really like this. I used this in the first book with. Um, uh, a NoSQL database called uh, RavenDB, and I wanted to do it with Cosmos. Um, oh, God dear. Um, so um, this is like the caching. This projection is like a caching, but I store it on uh, Cosmos DB, which is a NoSQL. Why do I do that? Because Cosmos DB and NoSQL in general are, um, you can, make them more scalable by having multiple versions of them. You can have you can have multiple SQL servers, uh, but they're quite, it's hard work because you've got transactions and ACID and all that sort of stuff. With, with no SQL databases, um, there's this thing called eventual consistency, <laughs> which mm -hmm. basic, basically means that it might be out of date a little bit. Um, so what I like about this is the SQL always has the perfect, absolutely right stuff, right? Uh, it's gone through trans transactions, all the rest of it. It's not going to be wrong. Um, and then you bang it out to this within a transaction. So if it fails, the SQL does fails as well. Um, but the nice thing with Cosmos DB, say you you selling in the USA. You could put a Cosmos DB on the West Coast, in the center, and um, on the East Coast, and um, make it go to those. So you get two benefits. You spread the load, and you've also made the data more closer to 
the user. So, so that's really leveraging the the power of the cloud as well as it as it being a NoSQL database. Yeah, exactly. I've just got one uh, just to test things. I've got uh, in London. I'm running a, um, a SQL Server Azure. Um, and the Cosmos DB, and they're kind of, I try to make them about the same price, yeah, so that I could do some tests against them. Um, and, and that's what's running now. So this is now running in my home, 50 miles away, I'm getting the data from. So if <laughs> I run this, um, and I'll just, just um, ding, uh, uh, uh. Let's see what the timings it's like are. like 83 milliseconds to me. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see uh, slow at the start and then that that doesn't move around a lot. You, oh, there you are. Yeah. So you've got quite a lot moving. It, it, it varies quite a lot because I'm using the, the Internet now, but I'm getting 120, uh, what, 130. I think that's pretty good. Um, for for what I'm doing. So, why is this slower than the SQL Cache one that we showed? Is that just be? Well, I'll let you answer. <laughs> so, so the the, the hundred thousand was running on my PC here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right? But, that always works best. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so to um, to compare SQL and Cosmos, I, uh, Cosmos is only in. In Azure, yeah, yeah. so I have to have a SQL in Azure yeah. to get, do a, a valid yes. uh, comparison. Yeah, it's, yes. it's interesting to me how you, we have this uh, these these various layers where we can cache things. So obviously, there's the CDN approach where you're caching like the final SQL, uh, sorry, HTML response or JSONs or whatever, which is like the most processed ca caching the the end results. Or as you've shown here, that's that's actually a really nice intermediary thing where you're 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 caching kind of like the database results in Cosmos, right? I mean, which yeah. is like an, a, a layer back, or you can even use something like a materialized view to do the same again, to apply the same thing, but in the SQL Server database itself, right? I mean, you can, you can yeah. like various degrees of how far you want to kind of push it down. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, I, I, and, and quite honestly, I, I worked on, uh, two or three years ago, I worked on a, 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 a architecture system for, a U.S. company that was going across the whole of the USA and they wanted to also go outside of the USA and there wasn't Cosmos uh, there then, I would really, really have liked to have that. Mm -hmm. That would have made that project. It was it was multi-tenant, sharding, ugh, you know, and Cosmos DB would have been a great tool for doing that. So let's do it sort on votes. Um, I, I have to say, I also like this because it's using Cosmos DB in a way that, that makes a lot of sense, right? It really leverages the NoSQL thing. So sometimes we see people trying to replace their SQL server with, with, uh, you know, with Cosmos DB and basically trying to impose like a relational yeah. thing, uh, onto Cosmos DB, which is not a relational thing. So they're not the same kind of thing. They're not the same kind of data store. And this is using both of them in a very complementary way. I really like this. Yeah. And too. also I'm only using Cosmos DB for the showing the, the views. When it comes to ordering, it goes through the SQL because there's not the same problem. I, I, yeah, it's a great way. So anyway, um, I, I could go through all these things, but we're like, going on. I'm going to go to the results, right? Um, uh, I will skip over that. Um, well, what, what we'll I invite you for another dedicated Cosmos yes. session. Yeah, we promise. What I would say is that there are a Cosmos. Any NoSQL is different to a, a, a SQL database, so there are differences there. And also, EF Core has some limitations, and I have to work around that. Um, you will see if I go back to this that one of the things that uh, EF Core can't do is count. So mm -hmm. I have to um, move over to using, uh, you know, next and previous. That's not uh, much of a problem because that's what how um, 
Amazon works anyway. So I couldn't count. So I got rid of it. And I did the same with these so that I they would not do a count because the sequel takes a lot longer to count. Um, so back to this. Um, so gonna... I think it would be worth mentioning a little bit about where we're going with Cosmos on EFCore for those who, who perhaps uh, are not fully up to speed on that. Um, so to, to Shai's point about it's a different kind of database, um, we, when the intention is not just to try to replicate relational functionality on Cosmos or to expose that through EF Core, but to expose sane, reasonable, correct usage of Cosmos uh, in EF Core so that you can use it as a NoSQL database in the way that you, you get the benefits from it. Um, we're at the point now where I think we've got plenty of feedback from customers saying, yes, we want to use EF Core with Cosmos. So that question is kind of answered. Um, and right now we're looking at these specific problems like the ones John P. Uh, Smith has put here. Um, we're looking at those specific limitations and seeing which one of the which ones of these limitations really make sense for us to uh, address in EF Core, um, which is not based on just people want to use them, but also based on, is this going to be a good experience and, and have it be a pit of success for Cosmos? Um, and so that's kind of where we are with EF Core and Cosmos. And we, we hope to certainly make some of these improvements in EF Core 6. It's in the plan. But then going forward, there'll, there'll still be more to do, I'm sure. OK. Just to say, what I did is because there are limitations in using um, Cosmos uh, by EF, EF, I built a version called um, Cosmos Direct, right, <laughs> which uses the Cosmos um, uh, SDK, uh, um, the Net SDK, um, so I could then ch you know check the two against each other, and you can see that Cosmos Direct can do counting. In fact, it's flipping fast it's 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 much faster than sql um so this is this is the thing here as i add more to the database does it get slower not really the count is about cost you about what 20 milliseconds more um but sql uh would add 110 more. So that's the one thing. Um, just for time, I'm going to, have to go straight to this. Um, basically, um, you once you get to this stage, SQL and you know, trying to recalculate the the um, the reviews manually is is a no no. You just can't do it. I, if Dapper, which is the best one, if I try and do that, it times out at 30 seconds, right? So you just can't do it. So you've got to do something. Um, and you can see across here that um, um, Cosmos and um, and its count does this, about the same value all the way across. SQL is OK, but overall, I would say Cosmos EF is um, Cosmos is a better than cached because uh, you get this scalability. And I'm done. This this is you can get this on that article. I I give you an idea of how uh, good it was in perf uh, in terms of performance and how difficult it was. End for me. <laughs> Excellent stuff. No, this is this has been really fantastic. There's uh there's lots of great uh, real world experience in here, real world advice. Um, uh, I think Jeremy's put up the link there to to go find all of our all of the the show links and stuff. I'm not sure if that's that what that one is or not, but that's I'm sure fine. it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I get I guess that's all that's all we have prepared. Um, we can answer questions if they if they still have any. Um, thanks for uh, appreciation of Alice, um, my cat. That was nice. Um, <laughs> she she likes to. Oh, she's back there now again. Uh, anyway, <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> the official performance cat of EF Core. <laughs> uh, Alice is not a performance cat. Mac, 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 the orange one who was here a little while ago, he's the performance cat. Alice is. Is she uh, like the reliability cat then, or yes, very consistency much so. cat? Yes, yeah. she's consistent and reliably slow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, uh, I think that's it for us. So we can we can sign off. Um, unless anybody else has anything else to say. This has been okay. great. I I love this content. It was awesome. Really Thanks for sharing, John. Yeah, I really appreciate having you here, John, as always. I'm sure we'll have you back again in the future for more good stuff. So, uh, And remember, next week or two weeks' time, we're going to have Julie Lerman Yay. ask her anything. Um, and uh, that's that's going to be really fun. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. So hope we can uh, see you all then. Bye. Bye.